Which one is Hey, how are you? Yeah. So I'll test four. He's Every day. I something last time. I just feel bad that I didn't test my fork and I didn't get your head. I'll get every time I want. At this point, I didn't have too much of a This is my problem. <laughs> unless I know it's a real, you know, unless it's a real bad issue. Yeah, it's What's up, Dalton? Good morning. Oh, so it does. And they're running around trying to get the same thing. But once I've got it all figured out, they're going to lose losses in the room on us going around the bank. Then they sit there and say, well, they're going to come after you next. I said, they'll yeah, come after us only if we pass through the building. <laughs> I don't want to tell Has everyone who wishes to testify signed up? You tell me Why don't you do this? Here's a. Don't you do it. There you two from a clear the way you can get to the CCD and then for arbitration for the chamber. And I know I was just I was so and I'll get it. So, so what kind of money is that we get? What kind of money is that we get? Is this what happened to your knee and you just made up this whole yeah. tennis accident? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, tennis. Uh, there's no traffic. I would. You do I'll 
Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to convene the Speakers Committee on Workforce Standards and Development. It's my intention to conduct this hearing with fairness, courtesy, and decorum that's expected of us as representatives. Please help us attain this goal. Members, please keep your inquiries brief to allow ad adequate time for all testimony. We do not have a quorum present, so we will begin this as a subcommittee. Um, we'll start with House Bill 1931, by Representative Love. Representative, go ahead when you're ready. Representative District 125, and I also want to thank this committee, Chairman, for allowing me to bring 1931 forward. And as we look at what the bill would do, I will read a brief summary on it. It says the bill would allow for repeal Missouri's prevailing wage law. Currently, the contractors and subcontractors working on public works projects are required to pay employees for prevailing wage for a particular locality in which the project is being completed. This bill would change the law. For contractors and subcontractors to pay employees state or federal minimum wage, whichever is higher. Contractors and subcontractors will be permitted to pay higher than the minimum wage if they choose, but that would not be a requirement. This does not apply to any work done for or by any drainage or levy district. House Bill 1931 will completely repeal Missouri's prevailing wage regulations. House Bill 1931 will allow Missouri to join 18 other states to utilize qualified and competitive bids. House Bill 1931 will enable Missouri taxpayers to get 20% or more for their tax dollars spent in the construction of school buildings, public buildings, parks, water lines, sewer districts, and so on. And I would like to read just a little bit of history and I think most of us know this, but some of us may to realize this. This is a real, unique circumstance. This House Bill 1931 is the same number as the Davis Bacon Act that was put into place in 1931. It says the law, the Davis Bacon Act, was passed in 1931 with a specific intent. Of preventing non unionized black and immigrant laborers from competing with unionized white workers for scarce jobs during the Depression. And the devastating discriminatory effects persist as minorities tend to be vastly underrepresented in highly unionized skilled trades and overrepresented in the pool of unskilled workers who have greater access to work if the prevailing wage laws were abolished. My goal would be to spend taxpayer money more wisely and stimulate more work and more jobs. And there are going to be witnesses here to support this. You're also going to see witnesses that are like lions. They're going to pounce upon this witness stand to protect their payments of higher wages for a few. When we could have fair wages for me. And with that, I'll take any questions. Other questions from the committee? Representative Smith. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good Representative Love. There will be a lot of questions, but I'll just uh, start. You just mentioned uh, something about greater wages for a few, and we can have a living wage for everybody something and if I read your bill correctly this would kind of bring it down to minimum wage or if a contractor saw fit they could they could um, pay more than minimum wage correct that's right all right um, I don't believe and I don't think anybody in this room would probably believe that minimum wage is actually a living wage uh, especially in this state I agree I agree with you right um, and getting to the to the bigger issue here, I, I don't 
because I've heard this before about you know wiser use of taxpayer dollars. If 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 the bill's intention was to to make it wise and for everybody else, then there'd be no exemption. And in your bill, you do have an exemption for for drainage and levy districts, correct? That's correct. Why set them to the side and, and not just fold them in? That's a good question, and I do not know how to answer that. <laughs> just be honest with you. Uh, Maybe uh, someone in this room could, but I do not know. Okay. Um, is is there someone in the room that maybe worked with you on this bill? <laughs> they Re researched it, and that was the exclusion, was the levies and the drainage ditch. And I have the same question you have. I don't know why. Uh, but you, don't, you don't want to change it back to, to just put everybody? I, I am assuming that it, you, that it can't be changed now. I don't know. Okay. 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 Someone here might. And, and I but um, I, I think what the, what the issue is, and, and you've had a bill like this, I think, similar to last year. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Similar to this. And you're similar. Yeah. However, could I make a comment on that? Yes, sir. I tried to allow either seven or 11 counties to opt out of this. St. Louis greater area and the Kansas City greater area. But that was not satisfactory. So I believe it would be better for Missourians to be like the 18 other states and not even have it. Okay, and, and I disagree because I'm looking at some of these states that are on this list that, that was passed out and they're not doing so high. Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, um, Oklahoma. We, we also would have in there and then South South Carolina. Um, isn't the bigger issue issue here is, is, is dwindling tax dollars in some of the rural areas and, and, and lack of reporting? From, from some of the contractors in those areas? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Um, seems a bit strange, but but I think that is the kind of the root cause because if, if there was, I, I don't understand why you would go after pay if all things are fine in community. And just to say that, hey, it's more wise spending of taxpayer dollars, if that's the case, let's import a whole workforce from Sri Lanka and bring them here and that, would be a wise use of taxpayer dollars instead of paying Americans. Would could I ask you a question? No, I mean, once you answer that, would not to be rude. Uh, we'll repeat that just a minute. Well, wouldn't it be better to just bring in a whole immigrant workforce from a different country and just to do the work for for next to nothing? Wouldn't that be a good use? Of well, that could be a point, but they're not qualified. This would allow for competitive, qualified bid. Okay, uh -huh. that's how the other states do it. Okay. Uh, you see Kansas, you see Florida. Yeah, I see a whole bunch of Iowa. places I wouldn't want to live. Yeah, Utah. That's a, that's a whole different subject. Right. What well, we're talking about, we're talking about 18 states that does not have any minimum whatsoever. It's qualified competitive bid. Have you ever been to Oldman Park, Kansas? Yes. Uh, did you notice the quality of the streets, the buildings? How about Des Moines, Iowa? See, see, they have water lines, they have roads, they have bridges, they have good quality structures, but they have qualified competitive bid. I know that for a fact because yeah. my son is a civil engineer in, in Oldman Park, Kansas. Okay. Well, not to waste up any more committee's time, thank you for your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Kirk. Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned that you were going to exempt. Kansas City and St. Louis greater areas, and then you said something about that wasn't satisfactory to somebody. We didn't get we didn't get any buy-in on that. I thought I'd be nice and leave the, the urban areas like they are, and only let the rural areas like that. They didn't like that. And when you say they, all these are the fact that the legal lines are still up here. Set this yeah. <laughs> so you're saying that what you wanted to do was. Exclude all of the rest of the state except for Kansas City and St. Louis. I did. Now, the, all, the rich, all my previous bills, yes, sir. Yeah. And those parts of the state currently have to follow prevailing wage That's correct. regulations, right? Okay. So, in your area, uh, remind me what county you're in. I have four counties. Okay. Well, that you live in, I mean. Well, I mean, that you oh, live in. Oh, no, I yeah. live in one county, yeah. St. Clair. Okay. So, if the prevailing wage in St. Clair was X, right, doesn't that tend to indicate that contractors in that area? charge that much to do the work and therefore if you allow folks to charge minimum wage you're giving an advantage to companies that maybe aren't in St. Clair County contractors that maybe are from Oklahoma 
and they'll come into St. Clair County and now they pay their employees minimum wage, whereas the prevailing wage in your county, St. Clair, is let's say it's three times higher than minimum wage. So aren't you putting your local contractors at a disadvantage as compared to that contractor coming up from Oklahoma who pays one third uh, of the labor costs? I'd love to answer that because we don't have any local contractors doing our water lines and sewers. They all come from Kansas City and Springfield. Okay. So good Missouri companies, nevertheless. Not always, no. We have a jail built in one of my counties here okay. a while back. But you just said you just said a lot of them are from Kansas City and Springfield. Well, that's pretty well where most of them. Okay. So uh, one come from Tennessee here recently okay. and built a jail in Cedar County. But nevertheless, they when they come and do the work, they have to pay their folks the prevailing wage of St. Clair County, right? So it is still based on the prevailing wage of your county. That's correct. Okay. So again, if we were to go to a minimum wage system. We're not going to go to a minimum wage system. Well, if we allowed. We're going to qualify yeah. competitive. But if we allowed contractors, you if we allowed contractors to pay minimum wage, currently the folks in your area and from Kansas City and Springfield aren't paying their folks minimum wage. They're, they're paying whatever the prevailing wage is in your county, right? So wouldn't we be given a leg up to, you know, Oklahoma contractor X that pays their employees one third the cost and therefore give them advantage to come in and take work that could go to good Missouri companies? You don't understand. There is a competitive qualified bid to start with. Okay? Yeah. So whoever's the, the qualified bidder, it gives an opportunity competitiveness for workers to work. Yeah, but isn't there a lot of pressure on folks? So if you're a city or you're a school board or you're whoever, isn't there going to be a lot of pressure to go with that cheapest bid? So you've got the minimum wage offer, right? You've got this company that wants to charge a lot less. If they're qualified, yes, sir. Well, that's right. So so let's say you've got a what what a, you know a contractor that meets the technical definition of qualified. They pay minimum wage and they're from Oklahoma. We're not paying they're, minimum wage. That is the lowest that they could pay, but that would be highly unlikely that you could not show me one place in the state of Kansas yeah. or the state of Iowa that's built a public work project in the last five years that's paid minimum wage. Okay. Not going to happen. So, so maybe yeah. we need to get off of that. Yeah. So maybe they pay. Well, your bill specifically says they're allowed to pay minimum wage. So to be that, clear, that, that, I mean you just read the, the summer of your own bill. It said that. So, be low, yeah. Right. No, be the lowest. So let's say Oklahoma company pays ten dollars an hour. That makes you feel better. Meanwhile, you've got companies in St. Clair. Maybe they're paying their employees twenty-five dollars an hour. So. Aren't we giving an advantage to that ten dollar an hour company to come into your county and take that work that would have gone to your local contractors or to Kansas City or Springfield contractors who are paying twenty five dollars an hour? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Other questions? Other questions? Representative Burns. Uh, permission to inquire. Go ahead, sir. And Mr. Uh, Chairman, I do want to keep this brief because I think we have a lot of witnesses that will be wanting to hear what they say. But Representative Love, uh, thank you for being here. And I remember last year, I think it was, um, maybe it was earlier this year, but you know, in the last session, okay, you testified that, first of all, you said that when you were building homes, you could build a quality home in five days. Is that correct? Just roughly, sir. Just roughly. Right. Well, there again, uh, I don't remember you qualifying that, and I'm not saying you didn't, but I've talked to so many carpenters that said that's impossible even with the chop journey but do that home with quality that someone can move into and live with all the technicalities and <clears throat> inspections that have to be we're not talking about a two-story mansion either we're talking about 15 to 2,000 square foot houses ranch type houses i can rough them in in five days you say rough it in though which is not completed home or and we got the windows and the doors set and it's ready to, push to do it with plumbing and all that stuff. No. Okay, you're talking about the I'm shell of a hole. a carpenter's rough end. Yes. Okay. I can do it five days. Thank days. You. I'm old enough, I can still do it. Okay. <laughs> and then secondly, and it was testified not only by you last year, but this year by a uh, contractor who has a, an electrical contracting group, about 40, uh, in rural Missouri and out, which are all under the auspices of uh, electricians local number one full apprentice train, which takes five years. And he said, all, and you said this last year, all contractors pay the same amount for material. The only way to save money, in your words, I remember, was lower wages. That's pretty well right. In other words, if we're mandating what the labor rate is all over the state, the only other opportunity is in apparel. And you know, PVC pipe 
in your county is probably about the same as it is in my That's what you, not that's much. What you did. A, you did say lower wages. Then you also made the statement that fifteen dollars is enough for anybody to make. In my county, that's a good oh, wage. Right. That's before taxes or insurance or rent or anything. That's about six hundred dollars a week before taxes which has felt well below what it takes to have a family even with one child. What's the minimum wage? Well, that's what I'm talking about. If you talk <clears throat> minimum wage, but then we also have, I believe there are people who are in this, in this building who have contracting companies that have been sued by the state government for violations of minimum wage laws. Um, that's a matter of record. So, my point to you is this, and I, and I do respect, I'll ask you this, and I'm going to stop, Mr. Chairman. Have you ever been to one of the training centers, one of the labor training centers for electric, plumbing, pipe fitting, uh, sprinkler fitting, carpentry, any of them, in, in sheet metal work in St. Louis area or Kansas City, and have been going through and toured them? No, sir. Well, we did last year, and Representative McCarty was there. Two hours for what they train their people to do. It's worth about $45,000 a year in training, five-year program, paid for by the contractors and by the unions. And every sign in that, in that building, and all of them, and when you talk to one of our union officials, they say, we don't send our people out to a job to cause a contractor to lose money. And electricians, we haven't been in business for well over 100 years, Local 1 in St. Louis, because we don't do quality, top, and our workers can go anywhere in the world as journeymen. Last thing is, and I hear, and I'm so sorry about what happened to Joplin, and I knew they wanted to rebuild. My father was born there. It was a tragedy. They wanted to waive these laws because to be able to build things in schools on that quick, which is in, just off the top of your head, sends simple logic. But I had an experience on Board of Education when I first got there. A lot of work was failing. Three years old, two years old. Those contractors would not come back. And again, when you go to a doctor, you want one who's been through medical school. You want a lawyer who's been through law school. Why would you want someone who's working behind a wall, particularly in a school building or, or in a hospital, who hasn't been fully trained for that job? I mean, it just doesn't stand to reason other than lowering wages. Could I ask you yes, a question? Well, let me, I have one, one more, and if the chairman will allow that, you can ask it. The other one is you say, what was the term you used? Um, approved contractor or? Qualified okay. competitive contractor. Who, That's not untrained. Or who sets that standard? Who makes that judgment in, say, your county? Okay, let's go back. When you were on the school board, if you, did a building project, did you have an architect that devise, devise and design the structure that's going to be built? You had an engineer and an architect that drew it. So you got your plans, you've got your roof plans. So it is the duty of the contractor to fulfill that set of plans. You have inspectors, you have people that are there to check and see that the work's being done. I'm just saying, let a contractor bid that that is qualified the most competitive. They have to do the job. They're not going to, I mean, what? I mean, that's all the question is who, and just because it's written on a set of plans, you know, don't forget that, that, um, that over the thing at the Kansas City Hotel that collapsed and killed a bunch of people, they said, oh, that union doesn't make a difference. That was a design plan mistake by the engineer and by the architect. And it was proven that it wasn't about the journeyman people that worked on it because they go by that plan. That plan's proved, and also briefly, four months I was on the St. Louis board, College Board for Community College. They had had a boiler done five years and went bad. Those are supposed to last 50 years. So that went through all of those plans and all those, but again, and it doesn't matter about that plan. Who says that contractor, where's the judgment, where's the test to say they're a qualified bidder? Let me ask you a question. Well, yeah. No, please no, answer mine. No, 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 I don't want to be arguing. No, okay. Answer what I just I said. I want to answer that. Representative in, in your statement, Mr. Gentleman, yeah. the 
this inquiry has gone on for 10 minutes. Okay. okay. I'm sorry. Please, it went too long. Please I stop that, Mr. Chairman. In your statement. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <laughs> Are there other questions from the committee? Not hearing. Um, we'll now get into those testifying. Because of the large number of people testifying, we're going to have to uh, hold your testimonies to three minutes, and our inquiries are going to have to be held to two minutes. Uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Bruce Hillis testifying in support. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Bruce Hillis. I'm a citizen advocate for economic freedom. And economic freedom is the right of individuals to pursue their interests through voluntary exchanges of private property under a rule of law. Any rule of law should be in compliance with voluntary exchange, not forced exchange. The principal question raised by prevailing wage laws is simply, does the law promote special interest, or does the law promote general interest? Once that question is answered, your decision should be simple. If Missouri's prevailing wage law promotes special interest, it should be repealed. If it promotes the general interest under Article 1, Section 2 of Missouri's Constitution, then it should be retained. Which interest does prevailing wage promote? I happen to agree with an economist, an economist by the name of George C. Lee. He's currently adjunct scholar with the Mackinac Center of Public Policy in Michigan, formerly with the Cato Institute. He said in a study in 2010, quote, prevailing wage laws are special interest legislation trying to masquerade as wise public policy. The remainder of my testimony will be devoted to trying to debunk that masquerade, which is focused around the economic issues of prevailing wage. Proponents of prevailing wage, they use advertising and they use commission, commission studies to demonstrate that prevailing wage or wise public policy. Their claims are flawed. First of all, you have to ask the reason, why would anyone want to spend money on advertising and studies except to promote their special interest? One such study is, quote, quote, and was done in Missouri in 2004, is the adverse economic impact from re repeal of prevailing wage law in Missouri <clears throat> makes the following summary statement in support of the claim that prevailing wage laws are wise public policy. Quote, in summary, the prevailing wage law in Missouri, as well as other states, creates a system of employment that is in the interest not only of the construction worker and his or her family, but of all citizens and local and state governments in Missouri. The basis of that claim is based on flawed economic statistical issues in contained in that study. What's being sold here under these mass motives is that there's some induced benefit from prevailing wage that trickles down to all the other segments of society and shares to make a general interest be obtained from the prevailing wage laws. That sounds great. You know, I'd like some more of that if it were true. Unfortunately, it is not true. The problem is these summary claims are based on specific economic outcomes that are concocted from snake oil economic sales. Induced economic benefits are simply this, that is passed down, the reduced spending from preventing wage gets lost revenue to the, to the vendor of, of food, the vendor of shoes, the vendors of everything. What's flawed in that philosophy is that the savings from preventing wage which would be retained by the citizen is just as likely to be used for more food, more shoes, and on down the line. There is no economic benefit of induced policy. Thank you, sir. 
Any other questions for this witness? Representative Brown. Well, thank you for your testimony. Um, you know, as, as a contractor, I, I often do uh, scratch my head with the, the enforcement of, of prevailing wage. Uh, you know, the people who come to work for me, I, you know, worked out the agreement with them privately to come work for me for that set wage. Uh, and when I bid on these projects, it's between myself, the owner, and the architect. Uh, I submit, you know, the, the required material list. I, I submit, you know, what I believe and how I believe I can uh, get the job done per their schedule. And, and that's part of the bidding process. Now with the prevailing wage that requires that, that I have to bump up you know, my wage and pay my people more and inflate that cost. Uh, and, and I don't really see and have never seen a, a true benefit of what, you know, what, what is gained out of the, the prevailing wage other than uh, special interests that have inflated in collective bargain a, a premium wage, but but it also comes at, at a much higher cost uh, for the um, you know, com complete project. So it, it does, it's kind of a wash and it ends up costing the people in the end results a whole lot more money for, for the project. So uh, that was just more of a comment uh, and I appreciate your testimony. Thank you for your comment. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Not appearing. Uh, I'd like to hear from Mr. Jeff Abusi in opposition, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, member of the committee, and yes, I am one of the lions in the back of the room. And we are here to promote fairness in the current prevailing wage law. We've had this for years. It's allowed people to compete fairly against one another whether union or non-union it's definitely kept the standard of living in the middle class for people that are well trained and highly skilled i represent the st louis building construction trades council in the eastern half of missouri and we're here to speak against this bill but you know for years this has worked in our state we've seen people that are supposed to turn in payroll information that would give the appropriate rate of pay for the various counties in our state. Some people continue to do it and some don't. But I think looking back about three years ago when we sat in hearing rooms such as this and came out what would be a good compromise to see our prevailing wage law in Missouri take place. One of them was the only thing that this legislature wanted was a, a fair means to report hours. And we've done that. It seemed to have worked. It's worked in the past. It continues to work. And I thank you all for your time. Glad to answer any questions. Questions for the witness? None appearing. Um, thank you, sir. Thank you. I'd like to hear from Mr. Larry Berry, please. I don't think Mr. In that case, let's go to Mr. Scott Ramshaw. My name is Scott Ramshaw. I'm a registered lobbyist for the plumbers and pipefitters out of St. Louis. Um, it seems like uh, we do continue this uh, dialogue year after year. I would hope that the Workforce Development and Safety Committee would look at legislation more fitting to raise expectation of Missouri workers instead of lower them. Um, we're against this bill. We cover 67 counties in the state of Missouri. Um, our training that we offer to apprentices is roughly about the five-year program. We put about $20,000 investment into each apprentice, no matter where they live in those 67 counties. So um, I feel this would not only affect the state financially going to something like this, but it, it's going to destroy the workforce in Missouri. We train our members to work on residential housing, to uh, commercial, light commercial, to industrial, to the nuclear powerhouse in Callaway. Um, we can't control where they'll work 
workforce will be needed or when it'll be needed. And we have to train the workforce when there isn't work in Missouri that they can help another state somewhere else and be employed somewhere else during downturns in the economy. Fortunately, in Missouri right now, there's an upkick. And uh, I'm happy to say all our members are working. We have about 3,500 members. Uh, and we have, there's locals all across the state, St. Joe, Kansas City, Springfield. And um, the other thing is, is uh, you know, there's checks and balances in all systems in this whole state. And this check and balance is to the um, prevailing wage, so that is a level playing field for the contractors. And uh, we would hope that you would not pass this to a lot of committees. So with that, thank you. Questions for the witness? Not appearing. Thank you very much, sir. Um, Mr. William Gable. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bill Gable. I'm uh, presiding commissioner of Johnson County and a contractor for 49 years. And uh, there's a lot of comment that's been made today, but to me, my primary interest is to see what we can do to improve Missouri standards uh, regarding economic development. And I'll just tell you a quick story. Some of you that may have been on the committee have heard this before, but I finished a wastewater plant in, near in the Chicago area and I was sitting at the airport. The gentleman sits down beside me and uh, I can't give up the opportunity to talk to someone so I said you're on business and he said sure because I'm in the manufacturing business in Georgia and we want to build a plant in the Midwest. I said build one in Chicago? He said absolutely not. I'm just passing through. And I said Illinois? He said no no. I said, how about Missouri? Would you consider a location there? We've got places for you, and, and we do have in Johnson County. And his comment was, Missouri is just like Illinois. They're blacklisted in our manufacturers association. And it's because of, and I said, oh, let me guess, is it because of the prevailing wage? He said, that and the lack of the right to work. He says, believe me, it's serious. We won't go to a state that has it. And whether he's unique, I don't think so. I recently was attending a meeting. Uh, our economic development director in Johnson County was the uh, state director, uh, state president, I guess, of the uh, economic development group. And uh, there was a gentleman there from Chicago who was lecturing us and he um, I did not expect him to say what he said he said Missouri really ranks low you got great work people but you have a terrible thing about how you can build those structures for these companies and it really hurts to see that and it hurts me as a presiding commissioner to see what that's done to uh, our county we've got a, a basically an empty uh, industrial park. Uh, I, 30 seconds. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think there's some other things that are a little bit misleading. To say that they're uh, no, not trained is just inaccurate. There's people that are non-union, have been trained very well. And a fellow that worked for me for 10 years, the best electrician I've ever known, has his own company now. And I asked him, he's a union contractor. And I said, how many do you have to go through to get a couple? If you need two new electricians, how many do you go through? He says, sometimes as many as 20. I don't think that's being terribly well-trained. I think that that's a unique, uh, uh, maybe in that area, but it's in a major metropolitan area, so I, I don't think so. But it's uh, in prior, I don't know how much time I have left, but I, I think we're done. Okay, well, <laughs> thank you very if much. If you let me go, I'll further questions through it representative norman to inquire um thank you for being here today mr gable you, you're rather unique you've been on both sides yes, correct I have. I have. um and when you were on the other side the contractor we we, we heard um the sponsor talk about being qualified bidder 
Uh, could you give us a little more perspective on that? I mean, you just didn't go in with a bunch of people who didn't know what they were doing, right? You had to prove that you were up to the work. Is that correct? And I might add that I was a union contractor for several years, and my men wanted out because we travel a lot, and they're usually, the union has local requirements, but uh, I don't think anybody, any contractor, would go on to a project as this gentleman was talking with, with unqualified people. I mean, you've got to have people that can do the work. Uh, you, you can't afford to come back to fix something that was done poorly. So I, I think the day of the, the uh, guy off the street or from the <coughs> local tavern to go out and do the work is long since passed. Well, you stand to lose a lot of money if you don't complete it correctly and on time, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I might add that in our project in uh, Chicago, we were on time and, and received a bonus for beating the, uh, the time limit. Sure. And then, and correct me if I if I deviate here off what you're really looking for as a public official, but as being commissioner um, responsible for the budget in Johnson County, which has part of District 51, or part of District 51 is in Johnson County, of course. Um, you're there to be stewards of the people's money. So, kind of have two responsibilities, not to overspend, correct? Mm -hmm. And then you want quality in the end. I mean, you're, you're really held to the fire. I mean, when you're going to come up for election in a few years, if you build a structure that collapses in two years, you're probably going to have to answer to the people, aren't you? That's right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Representative Carpenter. Go ahead. Uh, you shared an integral story about folks who said that Missouri is blacklisted because we're not right to work and we're not, uh, we have prevailing wage laws. Um, and, and this is one of the things I hear a lot when it comes to this, when it comes to this issue and the right to work issue, which you brought up, is sort of these anecdotal stories about, well, I heard from this employer that they would never come to Missouri. But isn't there a lot of data that goes beyond anecdotes? So we have states that for decades, have been right to work states or haven't had prevailing wage laws on the books. And you know, all the data actually says that those states are the poorest, the least educated, the least healthy states in the country. And that's after decades of being right to work and being uh, not having prevailing wage on the books. You know, there was actually a great study that wasn't even looking at right to work, they just looked at overall quality of life uh, in the United States. And 12 out of the bottom 15 states were right to work states. So I just wonder. If, if it's true that there's all these you know, great things that will come by making us right to work, <clears throat> excuse me, or repealing prevailing wage, then how come in states that have done it, after decades uh, of having done it, the results are still so bad? Well, I don't know how long <coughs> states have had right to work states, but that's not what we're... Here well, some of them, all the way back to the 1940s was when the first round let, happened. Yeah. Let's, we're here to talk about prevailing wage. Well, you, yeah, yeah, you brought it up in fairness. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, my, uh, my understanding is there are really, we've got this list that Representative Love uh, spoke about, but in, in addition to that, there are only about eight to ten aggressive prevailing wage states left. And if I understand it correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, Michigan set aside theirs temporarily, and Wisconsin just set aside their prevailing wage law. Now, I don't think either one of those are uh, having trouble because of not having prevailing wage. They're having trouble because they had prevailing wage. That's why they set them aside. Okay, but again, if there's a correlation between setting aside prevailing wage or becoming right to work and that state improving, better employment, better educated, better health, you know, more healthy, then how come the data doesn't bear that out? In fact, it, it indicates the exact opposite. So what, why in states where they have those laws, where they don't have prevailing wage laws, why don't we see this actually, you know, anecdotes are fine, but why don't we see those states flourish when they do it, when in fact all the data seems to indicate that they do very badly? I can't I'm sorry, that. gentlemen, we need to move to the next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Craker. To inquire, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Mr. Table. Thank you for coming today. It's uh, it's encouraging to hear uh, testimony from people that are out there living uh, in, the, in the parts of the state that deal with the issues at hand. So I know it's time for your schedule to come up. We really do appreciate it. 
I too am a former county commissioner, and so I can relate to, to some of the things that you're dealing with there in your county. Um, do you have a lot of bridges, like low water bridges and things, projects like that in your county that you have to work on frequently? Yes, we have about 300, no low water bridges. We have about 300 bridges that uh, we uh, have to work on regularly. Yes. And just for the record, most people don't know this, but most of the, all those bridges are not state funded. You have to come up with the funds some way to replace those bridges. Is that correct? Correct. And so in a county like mine, we have about 85 bridges and uh, our whole county budget is about $5 million. That's the sheriff's department and everything. So you can imagine uh, how tough it is for us to even build one bridge. Sure. Um, out of that 85 bridges, probably about 25% is all that we've actually updated and upgraded since the days of WPA. So many of our bridges were built in the WPA days, uh, going on 100 years old now, 80 years old or so. Even our courthouse was built in 1939, and, and so it's the same age. All those WPA workers were not union workers. Uh, they weren't trained the way we train people today, yet I can tell you that many of those bridges and that courthouse are magnific magnificent structures in the way they, they design and build those, those bridges. Do you have a similar type of uh, structures in your county? Yes, we do. We have a beautiful courthouse. Uh, we need some attention now. We need a new yeah. roof, but it's uh, and it is something we're very proud of. And this capital was built a hundred years ago, so we know it was built prior to many of those same types of uh, regulations and rules. But so the workforce of Missouri could do the job. But what we're trying to do is help counties, and cities, schools, public entities to be able to get more for their more bang for their buck, so to speak. And um, again, I, I appreciate you coming up. It's good to hear folks from folks out there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Thank you gentlemen. Uh, Representative Burns, uh, permission to inquire. Go ahead. Sir, um, I don't want you to think that anybody, particularly me or my three colleagues here, two colleagues, are questioning your integrity or your ability to work, I mean, and, and provide, because I understand what commissioners do. We have many in the areas that I've been around all my life, Jefferson County, further out. I think I will let the some of the representatives talk about the quality of, of uh, trained workers. But as we all know, you know, we're a country of immigrants. Many people came over from whatever country they were from. They were trained journeymen in whatever it was in. And I'm not questioning any of the people on this panel or uh, Representative Love who may have a contract to come. Back. And I think after hearing on we're after the same thing. It doesn't matter if you're union or non union, you want a quality workforce. And also, in, in the words of Henry Ford, you want someone to at least buy the cars you're producing. But I will tell you that basically what Representative um, Carpenter touched on is what was basically what was in our governor's uh, state of the state about we have proven record of some of the largest co companies in this world, Anheuser-Busch stayed here, General Motors, Express Scripts, who come to the St. Louis area, Kansas City area, and in Missouri. And it said in that his documentation in that uh, state of the state that we have the largest farming performing state in this country for new and developing jobs. And so, and you know, and that's all documented, it's in, just like from the National Budget Office, you know, with our Congress, these things are documented. And the second in the country, I believe, is Kentucky, which is also they have prevailing wage. They don't, they, they do not have right to work. So, and I understand you talked to someone in the airport, but we always hear those things on this committee. Why well, I talked to so and so, or someone called me, never a witness about that, and never documentation. So again, this is not about union or non-union. This is quality workmanship for our counties, our schools, and I think we're all on the same page here. All I was questioning is how these workers are trained and what does it mean that you're a qualified bidder? Thank, and, you, and, and, okay, and thank you, sir. Representative Bretton, to, to briefly inquire. Oh, yeah. Now, when, when, as a contractor, you go uh, to bid on a job, I mean, they had parameters of, of things you had to qualify for in order to bid on that job, correct? That, that is correct. And, and as a, a matter of quality assurance, most of your your you know construction managers would withhold a pretty hefty retainage, correct? And to in order uh, to in order to ensure that your your work quality was what it was. And if it wasn't, what what would 
I mean, they would have within your contract, correct, to to remove you and bring somebody in that would. And you would be out the contract and out your funds as that contractor because you breached your contract. I mean, that's that's what I've always dealt with. Uh, is that, that basically... That, that's correct. And, and I want to add that I was a union contractor and in, in, in all honesty, the higher the wage, the my percentage of markup is higher on a higher wage. It's not about trying to do it cheap. That's not the thing. We've got to do something for our taxpayer. And I'll give you one quick example that Representative uh, Dorman knows about is our little town of Chilhowee, it's not in his district, but they are very difficult financial streets. Put in a water system and the guy pushing two inch pieces of PVC together, fifty-six dollars an hour. Now, I don't think the guy paying for that in Chilhowee, Missouri, is making anything like that as a plumber. He's making 12, 15. I'm not suggesting we ought to hold it to any certain level, but those people can't afford to pay for that, period. Well, I guess one way to look at that, I mean, like I said in my previous statement, I mean, the people who are working for you, you've worked out, they're your employee and they've worked out the wage and they're happy. I mean, you don't go to their house and fortunately make them come to work in the morning to do the job. Uh, and, and that's one thing, if I ever wanted a raise or anything, when I worked for somebody else, I went to them and I asked for a raise and said I was worth this. And I, and I knew I was worth this. And, and if they didn't, you go somewhere else. <laughs> Thank I did. Gentlemen. Thank you. Other questions for this witness? None appearing. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Mr. McBride. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name for the record is Adam McBride. Here today representing the Eastern and Western Missouri Laborers District Councils, representing 15 local unions throughout Missouri, all 114 counties plus the city of St. Louis representing, again, roughly 14,000 construction black laborers. Uh, I, I didn't really structure any comments today. We've been through this issue over and over, whether it's thresholds or complete repeals or moving to a federal wage survey system instead of a state-driven one. We've talked a lot about training. We talked, look, I actually agree with the previous um, testifier that whether you're in a union or you're not in a union, doesn't necessarily mean you're qualified or not qualified. We take great pride in the training that we provide our members, and the training that they take to the job site with them. We believe in the product that our members produce. And that's not to take away that open shop contractors don't have qualified workers either. And I think that we're getting off on tangents here when the true question before us is about prevailing wage. You either believe in the objective of a prevailing wage law or you don't. You either believe that competition amongst contractors is good, you believe it's good that you can compete on skill, you can compete on overhead, you can compete on profit, but the one place you can't compete under this law is on how low you can pay your employees. That's what we're talking about. Supplies are the same, materials, unless you got a batch plant close by and you can get it closer and you can't sell it to anybody else. Right? So as a contractor, I want this law in place. And if the Senate hearing was any indication last week, and I don't want to speak for them, but this is public record, the AGC of Missouri, which represents 90%, everything but the Collar counties in the Kansas City area, uh, now since they merged with Outstate AGC, has both union and non-union contractors, and they testified in support of prevailing wage. They testified against Senator Brown's bill. They were in opposition to his bill. And that was amongst their non-union contractors and their union contractors. It's not, this isn't a union issue, and it's not really a labor union issue either. And I spoke to this last week in the Senate committee. We're collateral damage in this fight. This is a contractor issue. And that's all that testified last week in the Senate hearing were contractors. Uh, we're here supporting our contractors because they get shot and we get to attend the funeral. But that's how this works. So again, you either believe in the law, you believe the intent of the law, because after the changes we made three years ago, there's a one person that can provide me with a, a valid argument as to how this law is not fair. 
you cannot provide me with anything sound that says our current law is not fair. So if the going rate for someone's $15 an hour in accounting, regardless of what that occupational title is, that's what the prevailing wage law would reflect if it truly was the prevailing rate for that occupational title in that county. Thank you, sir, for that perspective. Are there questions for this witness? None appearing. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. I'd like to hear from Rachel Payton, please. Rachel Payton, Deputy State Director with Americans for Prosperity's Missouri Chapter, and we're here in support of Representative Love's bill. Um, to us, it's about uh, saving the Missouri taxpayers' money. Um, what Representative Franker said, we want to give them more bang for their buck. So that's why we support this legislation. Questions for the witness? Thank you, ma'am. Um, Mr. Ron Chapman. Thank you, sir. It's an honor to be with you today, and I appreciate the opportunity. As a president of the Jefferson City NAACP, the Missouri State NAACP, and a former director of labor, uh, I, I want to tell you that this is just a matter of fairness, and that prevailing wage uh, is an issue of great concern to workers throughout the state. People, workers, employees in particular, need to be sure that they're going to have a fair wage wherever they are in the state. And allowing a level playing field for the workers. And so, with that statement, I'll uh, ask that you not pass it out of committee. Thank you, sir. Are there questions for the witness? No. Oh, excuse me, Representative Burns. Sir, thank you for being I would like to answer the question that was brought out about Davis Bacon and its original intent, where it actually singled out, said, I believe, African American members and minorities. Would you just speak about that, please? A absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, as, as members of the committee are aware, uh, the historic disparities in terms of uh, pay opportunities or what uh, different workers were going to be paid, it's an American problem. It's one that's been ad addressed through different levels of, uh, of legislation. And even before I knew that I was going to be appointed head of bureaucrat one day, I had an opportunity to work uh, and make Davis Bacon wages, which allowed me to go on and get an education and pay for things like lodging and health care. Um, the, the issue has always been that certain people's labor is not valued as much as others, right? As an African American, as a person who is a minority of color, I, I have to tell you that we've always been on the losing side of that. Uh, no one is going to tell you that things are better or fair now, but they're fairer than they have been. And if you were to take away the prevailing wage, I can ensure that it would go back to being worse than it is now. And that those things would also break down, not only along color lines, uh, but along any other protected classification that you'd like to look at. Thank you, sir. Other questions for the witness? Appreciate your testimony. Um, Mr. Kevel, L.H. Kevel. Mr. Chairman.
The history of Davis Bacon is clear. Uh, the intention was discriminatory, and nobody can tell. You, you can argue about many things, but the historical record is clear. And 30 uh, seconds, please. Uh, any questions? Any questions for this witness? Yes, sir. Representative Smith? Go ahead, sir. Thank you for coming. Uh, is, isn't there money in it on the other side, too? Because you, you said the people that oppose it, there's money in it. But isn't there money on the other side? That's the issue about special versus general interest. Uh, special interest is money for some, but not for all. Uh, if, if what you're getting at is that without prevailing wage, without government setting some kind of standard, employers would set a wage that was unfair and unlivable. Economically, that doesn't apply. Employer, employers don't set wages. Marketplaces do. But then the employer administers the wage. So I mean, I mean, they're they're tied together. They're not just separate entities that are across. But what I was getting at before we go somewhere, there's money on the other side too. Because whether you're for or against prevailing wage, somebody's making a profit somewhere. The, the contractor that's forward or the contractor that's against it, somebody's making some money. All right, let's put it this way. From my point of view, some of the profit's dirty and some of it's clean. And your clean profit is the ones who support the bill. I, I guess they're, th those are more people to redress. Uh, a illegitimate use of government power is not exactly the same as, as to, to try to enrich oneself. It's, it's, we've heard about a level playing field. Hmm. I like that. Let's have a level playing field. And you cannot have a level playing field without. Okay, sorry. Okay, 30 seconds. Right. Does that answer your question? No, no, not really, because profit's profit. I don't think there's dirty profit, clean profit. I don't see El Chapo sitting here trying to. That's dirty, that's drug money. This this isn't the same. So there's money in it on both sides. Well, that's that's what I'm saying. 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 He did say moral and immoral. Yes, and I believe it's immoral. Time, gentlemen. Representative Gorman. Too far? Yeah. Um, thank you. I, I just want to say, as um, thinking back on my years in doctoral study, and uh, as a fellow student of mine said, I can't understand Kant. That was probably the best summation I ever heard of his the categorical imperative. But, um, I think the crux of what you're saying is, is, is if it's open competition, you're meeting the requirements, it's fair, then it's fair to everyone. Is that really the crux of what you're saying? That, that's another way of putting that. Aspect. And it has to be open, of course, and to be public, it should be. Yes. And we all understand there are certain requirements that have to be met. And we've talked a little bit about that with contractors and so forth. They, they don't just bring in somebody to throw something up, they've got to meet those requirements. And as public officials, they're there to handle it, right? They're there to oversee. Yeah, so performance standards. Performance standards um, in open competition will create fairness. Is that, is that a good summation? Yes. Thank you very much. Other questions for the witness? Representative Carpenter. Thank you. Uh, talk about a little bit about statistics and addressing you know, whether or not prevailing wage was a good outcome on growth and, and all that. Uh, you know, the document that was distributed today that has the list of states without prevailing wage laws, I mean, it, it reads like a list of the worst performing states in the country. You look at, there's an organization called OECD, the well-respected organization that put out uh, a ranking of the states and they took into account employment, health, education levels, uh, incomes, uh, overall quality of life. They, they took a number of factors and each, you know, you look at this list, Alabama, Arizona, Georgia, Idaho, Louisiana, Mississippi, Oklahoma, South Carolina, and Utah are all at the very bottom of that list. So, no, they're not. They are. They always do. You look, Google it right now. Right. Um, I mean, what, what I would say to you is there's a difference between statistics based on a static analysis and a dynamic one. Yeah. Um, I used to live in New York State. Um, it used to be the wealthiest state of them all. Uh, through their legislation, their uh, bad legislation, they have squandered some of the inheritance from their forebears. Mississippi does not exist, and that is, it's not the same. Mississippi is trying to raise itself up. So I would say, look at the differential 
not not some not some index number from a point in time, but the differential between look at Oklahoma's so, so, growth, for example, it, it dwarfs ours. So Mississippi, a state that has never had a prevailing wage law in the books and has been a right to work state since the 1940s. So we're talking decades and decades of time for the magic of these policies to work. They're actually last. They're 50th out of 50 okay. in, uh, on, look, on the rankings. Yes, sir. Look at it a different way, which is there's there's it's a stew. There's lots of legislation that we're talking about. Um, prevailing wage goes with right to work. Um, but there are other things that are going on. Um, occupational, occupational. Oh, I agree. They have all, all kinds of uh, right-wing policies in Mississippi that I think help account for having been 50th uh, for all these years. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Other questions? Representative Burns? Uh, Bruce Schoenquart. Sir, I missed your opening of your first statement. Did you say you were at the University of Missouri? Yeah, I retired two years ago, so on. I, okay. I'm free to shoot off my mouth here as well. Fine, that's, that's fine, sir. I'm not going to question that, but then you're very well in the history of the United States of America. And when this law was written in 1931, what, what working conditions for life was like for the average work in America? That they were so deplorable just for the United Coal Miners, federal government had to get involved because the workers were being killed trying to organize a labor union. And when the federal government got involved, 100,000 miners signed up for United Mine Workers in one week. The other issue, my parents, I, I, you're a lot younger than, you might be my age or younger, but my parents lived through that depression. Sure. My parents lived through that depression, the Great Depression. By 1931, is the year, coincidentally, the year my mother was forced to quit South Point High School and go to work. She's the only one in her family could get a job, and that was in St. Louis. They came from eminence because so vastly poor. And so the history from the time of when we had slaves till 1965, when they were given the Voter Rights Act by President Johnson, doesn't matter which president. Point being is the labor history in this country to those times when the federal government got involved have been deplorable. So now we have a strong middle class. I remember, you know, just what you said about New York. Uh, we're also the first country in the history of the world which is given a manufacturing base and it's in china it's the thing i can't figure out either if they're our enemy what are all american manufacturing businesses doing there so i understand your your ability to have the statistics and college trained but how would you feel if all of a sudden the university of missouri spread their standards it really didn't really matter if you had a phd or a doctor or even college they felt you were okay to teach statistics. They hired that person, and you lost your job. Time, gentlemen. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Other questions? Mr. Cavill, thank you very much. To hear from Mark Dalton. Good afternoon. Uh, Mark Dalton with the St. Louis, Kansas City, City Carpenters Regional Council. Um, I don't really know what I am anymore. Dirty, lion, uh, immoral, I don't know. But um, I, I think plans are needed to protect the pride. In this case, the pride is uh, the working Missourians that are out there uh, today in the 25 degree weather. Uh, as a carpenter for 18 years, um, I've only been, been in this building for the last couple. Uh, but it is a lot more comfortable in here than it is outside. Uh, to uh, to tell workers they're making too much money um, is uh, when they're out there freezing all day long it is kind of a slap in the face. But uh, just trying to wrap my head around the legislation to where the, the previous uh, testifier from the University of Missouri. There was also a, a study done by Dr. Kelsey out of the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Uh, he is the uh, economics professor that shows no uh, it shows no savings uh, in states that do not have a prevailing wage law. Um, so the cost issue is is kind of a it's a statistic that's thrown out there to favor whichever side you're on. Um, the quality is is where you're going to lose. You're going to lose quality in the buildings. If you look at just a quick Google study, uh, you, in 2013 there was a, an elementary school in Oklahoma that a tornado hit and the school collapsed. 
and it was due to faulty construction with cinder blocks, steel beams not being fastened correctly. Um, I mean, you can go back and, as someone who's been on the job for 18 years, inspectors are there the day you call them and then they're gone. They're not there every day. If, if you're looking to get your costs down, you're gonna find ways to cut corners. You're gonna have less qualified people out there to save money. Uh, now that building collapsed. You can hold retainers. Uh, you can uh, decertify that contractor from doing any more school work. But what you can do is get back to the seven lives of the elementary school children that were killed that day. Uh, they'll never get that back. And I don't think anyone in here can say that it's worth it to try to get lower costs, uh, which are alleged lower costs, uh, at the sacrifice of quality. Uh, my, my first job was at Top <coughs> for minimum wage. And if you're looking at uh, driving down wages, uh, I think the, the bill sponsor said higher wages for some versus lower wages for many. If, if you're going to drive down the wages, I would rather be in a 75 degree Taco Bell making tacos than out there freezing and smashing my fingers. Questions for the witness? Representative Bratton. It's no choir. Well, you know, I mean, when, when we talk about prevailing wage, I mean, you, you brought up that, uh, you know, we'll be getting poor quality and you know, I'm, I'm non-union and, you know, I work outside, did all weekend mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I work outside and, and I take pride in my work. And when I, when I've been on jobs, I guess I don't, I don't understand what, where your argument is on saying you're going to get lower, lower quality standards. Well, I'm not saying that because, I mean, I have to bid the same thing that a union contractor does. Sure. I mean, I have to submit do submittals of everything I'm going to use on that job, the same as you. I mean, you made the, the statement that you're going to get poor quality. And, and yeah, the inspector shows up and is gone. But that, that construction project manager is there over your back all day long. The architect is in there. And, and they are the ones that, that most tradesmen are like, oh, great, the architect's here. You know, because they are going over with a fine tooth comb. So I guess I, you know, to hear that that non-union is is going to you know result in death. I, I guess I'm offended by that. Well, well, I'm offended that you say this is a union non-issue because I didn't say it was. This this issue affects union and non-union the same. This is we're talking about local contractors. If you're, well, if I, you're I, I am a contractor. My my guys come to work every day. We we've we've negotiated. Sure that wage and they're happy they come to work every day now in your area the prevailing wages are set by area so your workers are used to making the wages that they make that you have negotiated with them right right um, which i agree that i think you and your employees should be able to freely negotiate the wages you want without government interference so your employees are used to making that wage now when companies from across uh, state borders start coming over and they can afford to pay their guys less because they're used to making less, you as a contractor are going to be forced with the uh, position to either find some way to cut costs and increase your bottom line, or you're going to be losing those jobs to out-of-state contractors. Thank you, gentlemen. Time. <laughs> Other questions of the witness? I'll, I'll make it brief. Mr. Dalton, I think... We hear this about people coming across the state, borders, what have you, but here's what people forget, those of us that live in rural Missouri. You've got county workers, city workers, school workers, and they're making a wage, whatever it might be, $15 an hour, maybe some are making 18, maybe even some are making 20. And then they're working outside, they're driving dump trucks, they're blading snow in the winter, they're fixing roads, what have you, in, in all the elements, and they're, they're, they're local people. They're raised in the local communities. They, they're us. And then you have a building project, a new bridge that has to be built, or a new courthouse, or whatever, and you see these out-of-town companies coming in, not out-of-state companies, companies from St. Louis or Springfield or Kansas City. And those guys are making 45 or 50 bucks an hour. 
the guys that are going to be living in this community and have all their lives and will be the rest of the lives, they look at these guys and go, I could do just as good a job as those people. This isn't right. It's my taxes that are paying for that, for that project. It's my taxes that are supporting this community. That's the problem we have. I'm just, just laying it out there. So think about it from that perspective. If you will. No, I do. And I think the prevailing wages are set by area. So as long as those contractors and those workers that are in the area doing the job, saying that they can do just as good of a job, under the current system, if they are reporting their hours, then that would be the wage and you would have local workers doing the work versus out of, uh, say, St. Louis, if you're in rural Missouri, you'd have St. Louis workers instead of them coming in, paying per diem and putting them up in a hotel. Uh, under the current system, if, if contractors were reporting their hours correctly in the rural areas, that would be the wage. But the problem is, in third and fourth. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions for this witness? All right, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rodney Gray. Mr. Gray, not here. Ah, uh, Mr. Shannon Cooper. Chairman Shannon Cooper today representing Construction Employers Coalition. I'm going to be brief and I, I can't pass up the opportunity to tell a story too. And the story is about a guy that owned a gun store in a rural community. And that, and that was me about 20 years ago. And I'm going to talk about a non-union contractor whose employees were a lot of my better customers. In fact, the store I'm going to tell is about three young men who hail from a community called Oxiola that the bill sponsor knows very well. My local non-union contractor participated in construction jobs on highways that were prevailing wage jobs. And some of the best years I had in the gun business was when that individual who was hiring those local boys got those prevailing wage jobs because that wage was higher than what he normally paid. Those boys lived with a county away from me, but they would come in that gun store with those extra dollars they made on that job and they'd spend it with me. I'd pay my employees and it'd go right back into the community. And those guys were happy and I was happy. That non union contractor made money, his employees made money, I made money. But the point of the story is that brought fairness to everybody involved. This isn't a union, non union issue whatsoever, because this contractor was a non union man. But he knew what the cost per hour was going to be. He bid accordingly. He got a lot of those jobs. And as the end result, that benefited me and my family and my community. So, that's kind of where we're at. I'll be happy to answer any questions. President Burns. <laughs> Briefly, I thank you for your comment. And no one here has said, the only reason I said the union uh, company or union uh, training plan is because those are the only ones I've ever toured. We want fairness for any contractor that's in this house, fair pay. But what I did say about, let's compare apples to apples. And, and one gentleman said he's a drywall contractor. One has a contracting business. If their employees are capable of a bridge project to do iron work, pipe fitting, everything it takes to build a bridge, which is very intricate, I have no problem if they're union or non-union. I'm just saying that they should be well-trained. But when we're comparing, I appreciate what you said about what it does. It does the same thing in our community. There are many non-union contractors that that pass the test in St. Louis County, Jefferson County, and they make that prevailing wage and it helps their families, helps the community. Basically, all I'm talking about is we compare the same thing. If your workers are qualified to do that work, then they should have every right to bid on it, but they should make it a, a good, fair living wage. That's all I'm saying. But I appreciate you. If you'd like to comment on that, I sure appreciate it. I think we're talking the same story. Thank you. Other questions for the witness? Representative Brown? Just real quick. Uh, now, your employees at your gun store, did you have to pay them prevailing wage? 
now they were all old retired guys that nobody put up with. So I was going to help them out. <laughs> and I guess in their world, I probably was paying for that anyway. Thank you, sir. You don't have a Colt Woodsman, do you? We'll talk later. <laughs> Are there other other witnesses to testify in favor of the bill? Are there those to testify against the bill? I didn't see your name on the list, sir. You called me. Mr. Chairman, I'm David Courage today, appearing in opposition to House Bill 1931. You and I have talked about this for the last several years. Uh, I'm testifying in opposition uh, on behalf of the Mechanical Contractors Association of the Eastern District in Kansas City. Thank you so much, sir. Others to testify in opposition. Jeanette Von Oxford from Power, Missouri, just going on record in, in opposition to the bill. Thank you very much. Questions for the witness? None appearing. Others in opposition? Mr. Chairman, John Ferris on behalf of the Associated General Contractors of Missouri, I want to go on record in opposition to the bill. Thank you, sir. Questions for the witness? Not appearing. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Aaron Griesheimer. I'm a registered lobbyist for Site Improvement Association, our construction trade association out of St. Louis, and we represent approximately over 100 different contractors in the St. Louis metropolitan area. We'd like to go on record in being opposed to this issue, and we wish the uh, committee to please vote this uh, issue down. Thank you, sir. Question for the witness. Not appearing. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Ken Mendes, uh, recently retired and now representing the Missouri AFL-CIO. Uh, Mr. Lewis had to leave. He actually, next door, testifying in favor of something, uh, which is unusual for us. So he's very happy to be over there. Uh, we'd like to go on record against this uh, legislation as it, it does. Prevailing wage does provide a level playing field, and uh, we're in opposition to it, as well as uh, Pat White, who is with the St. Louis uh, Labor Council. Thank you, sir. Questions for the witness? None appearing. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Bruce W. Holt. I'm a registered lobbyist with Painters District Council 58 in St. Louis, Missouri, in the same committee time we've done this year after year and again today as we did last week and will in the future. We're opposed to the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Are there others opposed to the bill? Are there those here for information purposes only? Not appearing. That concludes the hearing. <coughs> On um, Representative Wood, or Representative Loves, 1931. Uh, we will now go into executive session. Uh, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Here. I wish I'm old. I wish I can. Here. 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 Here.